brain is, uh, is everywhere. I suppose you know that. If you uh, put in the word brain in Amazon, you'll get, yesterday I tried it again, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of hits. And you'll find books that tell you about how the brain works, how the brain changes. You'll find books that uh, tell you how to use those changes in order to learn better. Uh, you'll find books that make you a better therapist. Books that will explain the criminal mind to you. Books that will tell you about love and about sex. Books that will tell you about art. Shakespeare and the brain will help you understand the mind. Books that will tell you how to cope with the teenager in your life. Books that will tell you about death, about the meaning of life. Books that will tell you about how to get happy and find enlightenment. Books that will help you make money. And of course, most importantly, books that will help you lose weight. So it seems pretty clear that as a culture, somehow or other we've decided that the brain is changing everything. It looks like we've got the idea that if we want to understand ourselves scientifically, if we want to understand the human mind, the human spirit, the place to look is in biology, and in particular the biology of the brain. Now, uh, I think this is a great thing. I think this is a great uh, advance in science. I'm a kind of a neuroscientist. I study the brain. I'm interested in the brain. Uh, you know, as Woody Allen said, the brain is my second favorite organ. I'm all for the brain. Uh, but I think that the overwhelming focus on the brain also has some downsides. And in particular, it runs the risk, or causes us to run the risk, of uh, overlooking some things that matter if we want to understand ourselves. And what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is make a bit of a case for the idea that in order to understand ourselves, and in fact, even to order, in order to understand the brain, we have to go beyond the brain and look outside the brain, in particular look at the environment, the social environment in which the brain lives. Now, the place I'm going to make this case is in psychiatry. And there are a couple of reasons for this. Uh, psychiatry has a fascinating history that I can't tell you about. <laughs> about 50 years ago, of course, if you were interested in mental illness, it was Freud's views that mattered. But Freud was, in a certain sense, an aberration in the history of psychiatry, because for a long time before Freud, there were psychiatrists who thought that if we want to understand severe mental illness, we should look at brain pathology. And as Freud, or Freudian, not Freud himself, but Freudian psychology was at its peak in North America and in Europe, there was something else happening. And the something else actually has a, a Montreal and a McGill connection. In 1950, two French chemists uh, developed a drug called chlorpromazine, which was marketed in North America as Thorazine. And they didn't know exactly what it was going to be good for, but when they gave it, or some other people gave it, to people with schizophrenia, they found that chlorpromazine reduced the symptoms of schizophrenia very, very dramatically. And the person who really started all of this in the early 50s was a man called Heinz Lehmann, who was a psychiatrist at McGill. And Lehmann was the first person who worked with chlorpro chlorpromazine in North America and studied it scientifically. So think of what this must have meant. For hundreds of years, we'd been dealing with severe, thousands of years, I suppose, dealing with people with severe mental illness, and psychiatrists had not the slightest thing they could do about it. Suddenly, there was a, a medication that turned someone from being severely, floridly schizophrenic into someone who might have some sort of a life. I think the idea that the mind is really nothing over and above the brain and severe mental illness is nothing over and above brain pathology must have really taken hold at that moment and we're still living uh, through the consequences of that. Of course, that idea really took off, maybe not in your lives, but at least in my life, when Prozac was introduced, okay, uh, I say that not because I take Prozac, but because I'm old enough to remember when Prozac was introduced. Uh, the introduction of the novel antidepressants, the so-called so so uh, social, so selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, has really solidified the idea that mental illness, severe mental illness, is brain pathology. So we're now living through the age of a brave new brain when treating mental illness means treating it by treating the brain, and in particular, by looking at the chemistry of what happens between neurons. I'm sure you all have heard some version of this. As you know, most neurons, not all, but most communicate with one another chemically. Neurons produce chemicals that goes out into the space between neurons, 
and the second neuron picks up that chemical and it changes its behavior. In the case of depression, of course, I'm sure you all know the chemical that's relevant is called serotonin. There are some other chemicals that might be uh, involved. And in the case of schizophrenia, the chemical that seems to be disordered is called dopamine. Now, this is a tremendously, tremendously important advance in psychiatry, not least because, to come back to psychosis for a minute, in the 1950s, some psychiatrists following Freud, Freud himself was never very interested in schizophrenia, but following Freud, some psychiatrists began to develop ideas about schizophrenia that really were madder than the schizophrenia itself. Uh, they argued in a kind of Freudian vein, in Freudian spirit, that schizophrenia was caused by bad parenting, uh, in particular by cold, aloof mothers, uh, usually referred to as the refrigerator mother. That's not my phrase. That's the phrase of a psychiatrist. And so the idea that schizophrenia was not caused by bad parenting, didn't make you a bad person, was actually a disease like any other, was an incredibly humanizing uh, phenomenon. And I think the same thing has happened in depression. I think the idea that severe mental illness is something that's not, as it were, in you, but in your brain, has these uh, humane uh, effects. But there's also a downside. And there's a couple of downsides. The first downside is that, in fact, these models of severe mental illness are not terribly good at explaining much. There's no doubt, well, seems no doubt right now, that serotonin and dopamine are relevant to schizophrenia uh, and depression, although the dopamine theory is actually waning. Um, but we can't really understand much of the symptoms of the illness by looking at the neurophysiology of these chemicals. So if you're, while it's true that if you're looking for a brain, as the scarecrow is, you want one with lots of serotonin, if you don't want to be depressed, uh, that doesn't, we can't say much more than that. And in fact, a recent development uh, makes the problem of our lack of explanation very vivid. Uh, there's a new antidepressant on the market. It's available only in France, as far as I know. It's called Tianeptine. I don't think it's available yet in North America, but it probably will be eventually. And Tianeptine also affects serotonin, but it actually reduces the amount of serotonin in the synaptic space. So I often think that when psychiatrists are explaining to their patients, at least psychiatrists in France have to explain to their patients that they're having tried Prozac and Zoloft and so on that increases serotonin, we're now going to try something that decreases it, but that's also going to make you feel better. I often imagine that they look a little bit like the scarecrow explaining that, well, serotonin goes up, it goes down, as long as it changes, you'll feel better. <laughs> this is not a very happy position for a scientific field to be in. But there's a much more important phenomenon, which is the phenomenon that I mentioned at the beginning that I think uh, is problematic in the biological conception of uh, severe mental illness. And I began to think about this in a funny context. 1990, you probably remember, Peter Weir, an Australian director, produced a film called The Truman Show, well, starring Peter Carey. So it was a film uh, about a baby that is adopted, is an unwanted pregnancy, and he's adopted in utero by a television studio. Do you remember this? And uh, he's raised in a television set made to look like, a sm like small town America. And everybody in the village, everyone in the town is an actor, and everything, every physical thing is part of the set. And everybody knows this is a television show except for Truman himself. Uh, and Truman is constantly filmed, and the films are broadcast as a kind of soap opera. And when we meet Truman at the beginning of the film, we meet him when he's about 30, and he's beginning to have some sense that something odd is going on. And he eventually discovers that, uh, that he's, in a, he's in a set. 12 or 13 years later, my brother, who, who uh, was then working as a psychiatrist at Bellevue, was working in an inpatient unit uh, treating psychotic patients. And he saw five patients over a couple of years who all had the same delusion. They all said to him, "My." I'm being filmed all the time, and the films are being broadcast on television for the entertainment of other people. And three of these patients said the same thing in almost exactly the same words. My life is like the Truman Show. My brother began to think of this as the Truman Show delusion. And my own personal research interest is delusion. And so one night he was visiting Montreal, and he said to me, can you give me some papers about this? Have you heard about this? And I hadn't, and we started to think a bit about it. Uh, we discovered that no one had described this. And uh, we began to wonder, of course, the real question, the, the tantalizing question is, is this a delusion that's being caused by culture? Could it be reality TV that's making people think that they're being watched? 
course, now there are other things you might think about. Could it be the fact that when you go to London, you're being filmed constantly, apparently being filmed constantly? That might make you delusional. And I began to look into this, and what I discovered was, of course, there are interactions between culture and mental illness. This is, in a way, not the most interesting of them. We understand that schizophrenia is a disease of the genes and it's a disease of the brain. There's absolutely no doubt about that. But in fact, we know very little about which genes, which brain properties are disordered in schizophrenia. But we do know quite a lot about another contributor to schizophrenia, and that contributor is the social world. Okay? Now, the social world is taboo in schizophrenia because everyone is afraid of saying or being heard to say if the social world has something to do with schizophrenia, that's like calling schizophrenia caused by bad parenting. It's like saying your mother made you schizophrenic, and that's understandably a terrible thing to suggest. It's, there's never any evidence for it. It's harmful, and it's an offensive idea. But there is real science suggesting that social life plays a role in the development of schizophrenia. If you lose a parent, if you have a parent who dies uh, when you're a child, you're at higher risk for schizophrenia. If you're severely sexually abused, uh, if you run away from home, then that's associated with a higher risk for schizophrenia. Remarkably, there's some evidence that if you're bullied in school, I couldn't find a good painting for bullied, so I just put a bull. Um, I, was <laughs> I was trying to finish a grant application. I was under some time pressure. So if you're bullied in school, then you're at higher risk for having delusions in later life, maybe not being schizophrenic, but even possibly being schizophrenic. Much more importantly and much more, uh, much more clearly, living in a city is a risk factor for schizophrenia. And the bigger the city you live in, the higher your risk of schizophrenia, okay? And that's been established with data going back to the 19th century. And finally, and most importantly, and most interestingly, I think, to me, is that it's now absolutely clear that if you're an immigrant, then you're at higher risk for schizophrenia, either than your community in your home country or the community in your adopted country. Now, you might think, well, of course, being an immigrant is a stressful experience. Maybe that kind of stress has an effect, and maybe indeed it does. But most remarkably, the children of immigrants have a higher risk for schizophrenia even than their parents. Now, this has been studied most in black immigrants to Britain, Afro-Caribbean immig immigrants to Britain, and we see the phenomenon in lots and lots and lots of countries. Almost every country that's been studied shows this phenomenon, but the phenomenon is greater to the extent that the immigrants are more like second-class citizens. And so, if it turns out to be the case that being a second-class citizen is really what's going on here, and we have no evidence that this is the case yet, but it's possible that it may very well turn out that discrimination and racism is a mental health problem. Your brain doesn't live in a vacuum. Your brain lives in a body, and it lives in an environment, and in particular, it lives in a social environment. So the fact that the social world affects what happens to your brain doesn't mean that uh, severe mental illness isn't a brain disease or isn't a genetic disease. It just means it's not only a brain disease. It's not only a genetic disease. There's a second reason for thinking that this shouldn't be surprising. And the second reason is this. The way I see it, the, the revolution in neuroscience, the idea that the brain is going to explain everything there is to know about the human mind, that idea was driven probably by a lot of things, but in part it was driven by the idea that what we want in a theory of ourselves is real knowledge, right? We want to know what really makes us tick. And if we want to know what, how, what really makes us tick, then we ought to turn to the domain that really understands things, and that's science. What science should it be? Well, biology, right? We're living things, and the only way we're going to understand ourselves, presumably, if we want to understand ourselves profoundly, is to turn to the science of living things, biology, and in particular to the science of, of the living brain, neurobiology. So I think part of the idea that the brain is going to tell us everything we want to know comes from what I take to be a pretty good impulse. Namely, if you want to understand something, turn to the science that can explain that thing to you. But there's an irony here, and the irony is this. The framework for all of biology is evolutionary theory, right? And, of course, that framework was established by Charles Darwin. And at the very heart of evolutionary theory is the idea that the features that an organism has, it has not simply because of what it's like intrinsically, but in virtue of the history it's had, in particular, the history of interacting with the world in which it lives, right? Darwin famously said, 
This principle of preservation or the survival of the fittest I've called natural selection. It leads to the improvement of each creature in relation to its organic and inorganic conditions of life. That's from the sixth edition of the Origin uh, of Species. So at the very heart of biology is the idea that to understand life, we have to understand not just the organism we're interested in, but we have to understand the organism and the conversation that the organism has with the world around it. And the conversation that our brains have, I can't tell you a detailed story about this now, but I think it's true, the conversation that our brains have is largely a conversation with other people. And so I think it's going to turn out to be the case that if we want to understand severe mental illness, and indeed if we want to understand mental life generally, if we want to understand what it is that makes us human, if we want to understand ourselves, we're going to have to go not just into the brain, we do need to go into the brain, but we also need to go beyond the brain and ask, what world does the brain live in? Only by asking about the world that the brain lives in will we ever understand the brain and, of course, the mind uh, that depends on it. Thank you. Thank you.